Welcome to Masterpiece Online and to our talks programme. This morning's panel discussion is particularly relevant to today's world, and I'm much looking forward to the discussion, art and experience in the digital era, balancing the virtual and the physical in today's public and private condition con collections. I'm delighted that so many of you from all quarters of the globe, I understand, have joined us today. Masterpiece, with its ethos of cross-collecting, the careful mixing of works of art from all periods and regions of the globe as a cohesive whole, owes its success to the passion, connoisseurship and scholarship of our exhibitors. In the absence of our physical fair this year, we are relishing the opportunity to showcase this knowledge to our existing and new audiences through our online talks programmes, videos by our exhibitors hosted on our website and short Instagram TV movies. Discovering about works of art through the voice of a passionate exhibitor is one of the most engaging ways to foster appreciation and knowledge. I strongly recommend that you visit our Masterpiece website and our Masterpiece microsite on the selling platform Artsy, which I hope you will find reflects the character of our physical fair. The website is a wonderful and exciting way to explore the fair and I think you will find still allows the serendipity and opportunity to discover perhaps unfamiliar works of art that is such a hallmark of Masterpiece. Masterpiece is dedicated to supporting our cultural partners who are facing great challenges due to forced closures of public galleries and museums. This year, we are offering unlimited free access to all artworks, conversations and content during Masterpiece Online at masterpiece.masterpiecefair.com. In return, we ask that you consider donating to the Masterpiece Cultural Fund to support museums in the UK, the United States and Asia, and a link to donate is included in the chat box. I'm particularly delighted to welcome our moderator this morning. Scott Rayburn is a renowned journalist contributing to the Art Newspaper and the New York Times, amongst other publications. And Scott, I would like to thank you so much for joining us at what is a rather early hour in New York. And if I may, I will now hand over to you to introduce the panelists and to get the proceedings underway. And thank you, Philip, uh, for that introduction. Uh, it's a very varied and distinguished panel, which I think covers three of the most sort of important areas of the art world at the moment that are being so profoundly affected by this crisis. Uh, let me start with Helen Jacobson, who's the senior curator and curator of French 18th century decorative arts at the Wallace Collection, which was the first museum I ever went to, and it's, uh, I, I love that museum. Uh, we have Rebecca Lyons, who's director of collections and learning at the Royal Academy of Art. And finally, we have Fran Francis Sultana, who is the designer and CEO of the David Gill Gallery, one of the top galleries specializing in contemporary design. Now, as, as Philip mentioned, as, and I think we're all, all aware, the art world's going through an absolutely extraordinary moment at the moment. Over the past few months, COVID has shut down hundreds of museums and galleries across the world. And the commercial uh, art world is also in virtual shutdown uh, with uh, major art fairs like Masterpiece take on a virtual format and galleries having to try to do the best business they can through virtual viewing rooms. Now, had this happened 30 years ago, it would have been uh, an existential catastrophe for the art world. But now with digital platforms, museums and galleries can at least remain in the public consciousness. What I wanted to ask my panelists, first of all, is to what extent, extent the digital experience can replicate the live experience of looking at artworks, and to what extent can digital strategies compensate for lost revenues? And probably the most important question of all is how can art compete with a video of Dax and Puppies on TikTok? That's a really hard one. So <laughs> let me start um, with Helen. Uh, how are you getting on with your digital strategies and uh, how successful do you think they've been? And finally, how do you actually measure success? Well, um, I'm glad you said uh, 30 years ago, if this had happened, because I think probably even 10 years ago, if this had happened, uh, we would be in a much, much different place from where we are now. I mean, like all institutions, we have been 
um, focusing very much on our digital strategy over recent years. Uh, we, we relaunched a, a digital strategy in 2018 and, uh, uh, and the, um, uh, the events of the last four months have proved just how useful that has been and how important it is now uh, for us to communicate with, an audience, uh, with audiences like that. I mean, we're finding that uh, we reach uh, so many more and diverse audiences through it. It's a way of communicating with a new audience for us um, through, through the digital technology. Um, we've had um, a, a real upgrade and, and refurb, refurb, if you like, of our uh, website um, a couple of years ago. And that's made an enormous difference. It's very visual. Uh, it's very object focused. Um, we are extremely lucky to have a, a rich and deep collection across many different um, areas, many different media. And um, with digital photography, as it is now, um, we're, we're able to keep our collection in the forefront of audiences' minds without actually getting them to Hartford House, which of course now they can't come to Hartford House. So we also back that up with a social media strategy like everybody, I'm sure. Um, and uh, that's been very good at reaching, again, reaching out to an audience that we hadn't perhaps before communicated with. Um, we also have an online learning program. Um, that's a way of, particularly in the last four months or so, that's a way of keeping our presence with the, um, with the, with the audiences that we've been engaged with on the learning front. Um, and, you know, I think, to be fair, we've, we've actually had a pretty exciting few months on the, on the digital front uh, at the Wallace Collection. And it's an area that we've definitely realized we needed to focus on, we are focusing on, and I think over the next few months and indeed years, it'll be at the forefront of what we do. Um, it's not a way of replacing what we have in the collection. It is a marvelous tool for reaching out to getting to new audiences and also for deepening uh, the, the, the knowledge and the understanding of our collection out there through blogs, through the learning, as I mentioned. Um, so it's something that's very much in the forefront. We measure it by um, numbers. You know, numbers is, is always a useful way of looking at things, but also through um, the length of time, dwell time that people spend um, on our website, with social media, um, also how they engage with our social media. Uh, we, we, we like to do more interactive things, not just put out photographs, high res images. You know, we, we like to have quizzes, we like to uh, get people engaged in conversations about our artworks. Um, and so that's another way that, that we, we measure success. Okay. Let me move on to Rebecca. Um, I was looking at your website and it's, you've got a nice variation there. There's a great hour and a half virtual tour of the Picasso on paper exhibition. Then you got a sort of 60 second hit of um, Hogarth, Gin Lane and Beer Street, which I thought was great. So but tell us more about your strategies. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks very much. Um, lovely to be here. Um, I think very like Helen, in a way, we, we started a little bit, obviously, in a situation of, of kind of emergency. So the doors closed and we turned to what we had online already. So we did a lot of repurposing of content and we were very lucky that we had some really fantastic virtual tours of our exhibitions that were able to give these protracted, almost exhibition experiences. You could go to Spilliot, you could go to um, subsequently Picasso and really spend time there. Um, but we also looked again at what we already had, um, podcasts that actually suddenly became relevant again or more relevant again. Um, we looked at resources that we'd had online and were able to reshape and repurpose them. So the digital team did an amazing job of um, kind of repackaging a lot of content while we thought about what our strategy would be for the period of closure. We're quite lucky in a way to have um, our living artists, our Royal Academicians, um, and we put out a call to them, of course, um, and they came back to us with stories and thoughts about working in isolation and how, of course, so much of an artist's experience is often working in isolation anyway. Um, so we were able to get those kind of almost um, live voices involved. Um, and then I would say 
we, we've had a, a sort of tremendous success with social media in a way that's possibly our only attempt to rival TikTok's um, fluffy puppies or, or dancing, which has <laughs> been our daily doodle um, from our wonderful social media manager who has sort of captured, <clears throat> I think not, not, not perhaps our usual audiences, although many of them will have appreciated it, but a, a kind of cult following on Twitter. Um, and what I like about that and where I think, Helen, this does link to something that you said as well, is that it, is, it has felt interactive. And that was my greatest concern about all of this digital content is that we would return to a world where um, it was a one way direction that we would deliver information and people would not be able to talk back to us. When of course the, the real beauty of a, a museum experience is that shared experience. And so I think some of those ways that people can talk back, we've had a fantastic project taught online with A-level students and, um, or students at, at sort of um, that level of, of working uh, towards perhaps going on to a career in the arts. And they've been kind of talking back to us on social media. We've been sharing their work. Um, so I think finding those creative ways to hear the voice of our audience has been a really interesting challenge as well. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Francis, you're uh, with, a, with a commercial gallery. Uh, I noticed at the moment you've got two very elegant exhibitions online. Uh, what's your experience of this, the, the translation to an online own experience of, of the material you're, you're representing. Yeah, good morning, Scott. Good morning. Well, it's, it's been very challenging because, you know, nothing can really take away the physical experience. And obviously, you know, like Rebecca said, we, in all, in all businesses and museums, institutions, it was a bit of an emergency situation going on. And, um, you know, our gallery has been established over 30 years. It's kind of more old school than the newer variety of galleries that are coming along now. Also, a lot of our collectors, some are older and not so good with the virtual experiences or so much of communicating digitally or more online. So we, we, we've actually been spending this time in developing nice ways to communicate. We have gone online because there is no other way to show an exhibition currently. But at the same time, it's still maintaining as much human contact with individual communications, which in a world where at the same time we need to make business is finding a way to keep that situation and those, and those kind of relationships alive. And at a time when most of us are displaced in our normal lives and where we are, many people are in different homes or they're in different countries where they're meant to be. It's, I think, you know, we, we're trying to find ways to ensure that we can have some sort of normality. You know, we feel a little bit more normal rather than facing the situation as a whole. So it's, it's, it's a learning curve. And I think for most commercial galleries now, um, no matter what they're specializing in, we're, we're all trying to develop a nice way to keep the human factor there and understanding that maybe for the next few years, we have to change our approach and change how our programming works. So I think it's, it's, it's really, at this point, it's early days to see where it's going to go because we're only into the first few months and this is an ongoing process for everyone. Okay. This probably is sort of horribly premature, but I'm just wondering about the future because um, you're all having valuable experiences adapting to this, this crisis and using online techniques. And I'm just, I'm just wondering how you visualize the combination, the synchronicity of technology and the renewed live experience, how this can, can take institutions and galleries forward, particularly bearing in mind that there, we expect huge losses in terms of budget funding for major institutions. And also, even in the private realm, there are going to be plenty of people who have lost quite a bit of money over the last year or so. Um, but can, perhaps we could start with Rebecca. How do you see the sort of vision of the RA going forward 
integrating what you've learned from the, the online experiences and those strategies? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's a really big question for us because, of course, we are an independent charity and therefore we have been losing over a million pounds a month since closure. We're, we, we're not funded any other way. But one of our biggest um, revenue streams and I think one of our biggest debts of, of gratitude really is to our museum friends. And I think in trying to help to understand what uh, a blended offer might look like, I think that's what it's being called now, a sort of hybrid offer, that you can come to us. And of course, uh, when we reopen, we will welcome you with open arms. But actually, if we can have at the same time uh, a program of engaging digital content, then you might still consider becoming a friend and you might be able to participate either digitally or in person, depending on how comfortable you're feeling. Can I just jump in there? Is, is, is that an example of how in the future the, the, the digital platforms actually might be able to um, generate funding and revenue for the institution? I think it's, it, it's one, possibly. So it's not directly linked to, um, it, it's just part of an offer that would encourage someone to want to remain loyal and, and be a loyal friend to us. I think we are really struggling at the moment with that mm. concept of um, a paid digital offer because what we've wanted to do is just to keep our doors open virtually, to extend as much content as we have, to keep sharing it. And everyone has done that, you know, theatres and opera houses and this incredible sort of generous sharing of culture. Um, to try to almost keep people's spirits up as well during this period. Yeah. But I don't know how sustainable it is for us to keep producing um, online content, new online content, without some revenue stream that's uh, sort of connected to that. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what the others think. Okay, Helen. Uh, um, I, Rebecca, I'd like to pick up on that. Um, I think uh, there is a danger that people think digital content is free. You know, we just produce it and it's free. But actually, it can cost um, the institution quite a bit, so depending on what it is, to, to get it out there. We receive it for free. Um, so I think we're going to all struggle with this. I think we're going to have to prioritize. We're going to have to be very clear about what it is that we are offering, what it is that we um, that, that, that our audiences will get from us, will expect from us. Um, I think we are a little different um, from Rebecca in that we have this um, incredibly strong collect, permanent collection, which I think we will have to focus on in the short term, we want to focus on, um, and, and really use that and, and use technology, digital technology to get um, it better known perhaps. But that is arm in arm with getting people into the museum to see the collection. Um, it's, it's not uh, a replaceable experience uh, online. Uh, like Rebecca too, we are incredibly indebted to our friends and benefactors who've been so supportive. Um, and I think, I think that is an area that um, the, the, the friends, the family of friends, um, we can strengthen through digital offers. Um, to what extent we will have to start charging for some of these digital offerings. Um, we too would, would prefer not to, but maybe it's an area that um, on the first instance you can offer perhaps a, a lighter, shallower experience. And then if you want to dig deeper, perhaps the, the deeper offering can be a paid for offering. Maybe we'll have to develop um, some sort of strategy. Is, is this quite areas. problematic given that there's so much free stuff out there on the internet though? It's very difficult. It's very difficult. I mean, there are a number of um, galleries and museums that do paid for online courses, for example, already. Sure. That's, that's quite a, a well-established um, system. And, and maybe that's an area that the, the Wallace Collection will look at doing too, um, or more of an in deeper. But yes, it's very difficult. You have to have an offer that people will consider worth paying for, rather than just getting it for free. And I think that's where um, expertise and uh, depth of the collection will help us if, if we get it right. Okay. Francis, with a private gallery, it's a, a rather different situation, but I'm just wondering how you feel in the future, the knowledge that you gain from these digital platforms and initiatives, how it can be useful once 
the, the live gallery is open again and you're starting to interact with, with, with live collectors? Well, I think it's a time when for all commercial institutions to really, you know, review and see how best they can utilize, you know, lesser income coming because most galleries now their income is less. The last quarter has proven that and the financial futures for commercial as well as institutions, museums, we are all going to see a loss in revenue. So an investment is required from commercial galleries to be able to outreach more and a connection with fairs such as Masterpiece, which has a, a broader reach where they can be viewed. Because if you remember now, footfall is limited, even with non-essential businesses opening up in any city like London, Paris or New York. So, you know, the strategies are going to have to change. And obviously, at all institutions and businesses want to try and keep a normality and look after all their staff to ensure that everybody has jobs and, you know, to really have a success and to continue the business in a challenging time. And like from my point of view now, it's, it's actually reviewing what investment you do into digital and trying to make, you know, tangible decisions going forward, especially now in the autumn season and looking ahead for the next 12 months to make Can it I work. Can I just jump in and ask one, one good, with your gallery, you, you're, you're selling furniture and objects, decorative arts, three mm -hmm. dimensional things. Does that create an additional challenge for you, given that online platforms have traditionally, well in the past, been quite successful with things like flat art, prints, multiples, that kind of thing? Yes, it is very challenging. I mean, what I've looked at personally, and I think this is really, you know, there's the newer, younger generation to me who are very smart and all this kind of thing, is that if you look at how the luxury uh, designer market has moved forward at this time, which is a market that's actually taken quite a drop, it's all about now uh, a different experience when you view something. It's, so it's not so two-dimensional. So instead of having a normal photograph, people need to see more video content. And so it's a different kind of investment when you're trying to show a work of art now. So people can get a more, a better experience of a 3D object or piece of furniture or an antique or a sculpture. So I think things, technology and what people are being, you know, trying to use is, is actually changing. So it's rapidly changing from our point of view what we're doing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Next, I wanted to, to, to sort of introduce a, a sort of a bigger theme in a sense, um, which is interconnected with, with the, the digital world. And it's the, it's the whole issue of experience versus possession. There's been some very interesting uh, market research done in recent years, particularly among millennials, that increasingly they value experience over owning things. Now, paradoxically, this thirst for experience is generally sort of commemorated through an Instagram photo, um, which, which creates an interesting contradiction there. But what is interesting about the art world now, I think, is that increasingly going to an exhibition or going to a museum or going, say, into a, an art fair is the experience, rather than concentrating and focusing on the individual object which I think creates problems for museums. It certainly creates problems for the art world because people, people don't concentrate as much as they used to on individual things. Uh, if you watch people in galleries, they, they wander around, but they don't spend that long looking at individual objects. Now, I'm just wondering, given this sort of culture of distraction, how you as gallerists and museum curators, how you might be using technology in a way to get people re-engaged with the individual objects, which I think is, is an important challenge for the art world now. Uh, but, but start with, with Helen, because for example, you're, on your website and your, your uh, digital material, you concentrate very fascinatingly on these amazing 18th century objects. Um, what do you think about, about this theme? Well, uh, you're absolutely right. You come into the galleries sometimes and you see people walking slowly through, but, but you know, it, it's quite clear that um, many people don't actually stop and look at the, at the individual art object. And, and perversely, in a way, I think actually that this digital technology can help us with that. 
I mean, the high resolution photography, of course it can't replace um, what it's like to look at a, an actual work of art, but um, it can certainly draw you in, uh, particularly, uh, may I say, for three dimensional objects like you were discussing with Francis. Um, you can turn things around, you can get up close, you can see details. And, and that, I hope, will excite people to then want to come in and look at the real object. Um, so I, I see that as a real positive. Um, there's also some wonderful things that can be done now with digital modeling. Um, and in fact, we're doing some work on, on our French 18th century Reasoner furniture, which we are having digitally modeled so that you can explode the piece of furniture, you can interact with it, you can move it around. Um, this appeals to people who like technology and like playing around with, um, with their screens, but it also is a fantastically new way of looking at furniture, um, and it can be done with other objects too. But well, can you I can jump in there, because you, 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 on your website you've got this fantastic um, clock, haven't you, from Avignon, which is yes. a completely mad piece of uh, 18th century luxury. <laughs> um, but for example, you mentioned that it has a special a special chime. And I just wonder, it would have been nice to actually be able to hear the clock in the presentation. That would have been fun. I suppose that's the sort of thing you're talking about. I am talking about that. And, and um, dig digital reproduction of sound is a wonderful thing. You come to our galleries and you hear the sounds of the clocks ticking because we have a clock in every gallery. That's the sort of experience that, that we can offer in the galleries. And it's the sort of thing we can recreate outside the galleries. But I think you put your finger on something there because when, when one sees these videos, and in fact, it's true of some exhibition videos, you know, we've all been looking at virtual exhibitions over the last four months. Um, sometimes the music that gets played along is incredibly annoying or the, 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 over, the talk overlaid over the video is incredibly annoying. Sometimes actually just to listen to the clock ticking on its own would, would be very, very, um, uh, fulfilling, I think, in a way that you, you, you sometimes don't get with the voice. Um, yeah, I think. <laughs> okay, Rebecca, what, what do you feel? Uh, thanks, there's so much to, to kind of unpack there. Actually, yeah. one of the things pre-COVID, I suppose, that had been one of our kind of signature leading the field type of things was our late Royal Academy Lates takeovers, which were these extraordinary kind of immersive parties where the whole gallery was taken over and people could could really kind of come for that um, blend of the experience economy and the art world. And um, I know we've been looking very hard at what other kinds of immersive experiences have been taking place during lockdown, what music festivals have been doing, how are people sort of continuing to party in their own living rooms and things like that. So um, if I could jump in there, but when there's like problem with the immersive experience, of course, it's, it's yeah. an act of congregation. Which well, it's is, an act of congregation, exactly. Yeah. So for the moment, that is not possible. Um, but I would say that um, I feel, I don't know whether we will return to our frenetic levels of, of, of kind of hectic lifestyles, but Many of us in, in this period of closure have been forced to slow down the way that we look at things. And so even if we continue to put on temporary exhibitions, which of course we will, that is the main thing that we do at the Royal Academy, um, whether we might slow down a little bit as we walk through them, whether we might look at fewer objects or whether we might use more objects. I mean, we're not, our collection is uh, actually quite extensive, just not very well known. Um, perhaps we will start to use more from that. But I think that idea of slow looking is so wonderful online. And yes, uh, the, the kind of white squiggle that you can see on the screen here is actually our Michelangelo Tondo. And online you can get right up close to claw chisel marks and, and flat chisel marks and you can really see everything. Um, there. So yes, there is that ability to look closely at objects online, but I wonder if we might recreate that also in our gallery spaces by also uh, uh, the, the other thing I suppose is the visitor journey to something, that it is the whole experience. So meeting a friend, 
walking through an exhibition, sitting down and having a coffee. And, and that is part of an experience that isn't just about the focus on the artworks. It's, it's a communal kind of experience that is harder to replicate online. It's interesting what you say about, because there's been lots of um, talk and writing about the blockbuster exhibition over that it's going to be impossibly expensive and impractical to fly great works of art across the world. And so that now actually museums will have to concentrate on what they have, uh, which in a sense will it also encourage looking more closely, won't it? Which, which possibly could be a, kind of a positive thing. I think so. I mean, I think many people, many of us were talking about the environmental concerns around yeah, course, blockbuster yeah. exhibitions long before coronavirus and the sustainability of that kind of, of, of reach. But I would just say in, in defense of the blockbuster, I suppose, is that so often the blockbuster then becomes this idea of a, of a kind of, you know, it's a big money machine, it becomes a must see, you tick the box. But actually when you look at an exhibition and why it comes together, the, the creativity of that, the opportunity for scholarship, the ways that new ideas are generated by the bringing together of objects, uh, you know, there will still be a role for those exhibitions, bringing those objects together to talk to each other, but maybe it's fewer of them. Maybe they stay with us a bit longer. Maybe we look a bit more slowly at them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Francis, moving to this, this uh, whole issue of, of trying to get people to look at things a bit more, uh, individual objects. Actually, actually, I think Masterpiece is a very good example because it, it, it's, for me, it's always been the ultimate sort of experience fair. It's been a great fair to go to, you have a lovely lunch, you wander around and so on. Uh, unlike sort of T5 Master, where there is this more sort of commissarial, heavy commissarial agenda, uh, master, uh, Masterpiece is a, a more, more enjoyable social event perhaps. But what do you think about digital and its role in getting people to, to look at objects again closely? Uh, you know, I think firstly, I think that, you know, we are going through a time of pandemic that will have an effect for, you know, some time to come. But, you know, in past pandemics, you know, life does eventually get back to a new normality, which may realise and make us personally all wake us up to certain things in our lives which we need to kind of be less fast, enjoy things better, spend more time visiting museums, taking in the art that we see, you know, actually making more time for ourselves. I mean, the thing with like Masterpiece, for instance, of course, it's a great social event and we're all human at the end of the day and we want to experience human things. And we're great at adapting to a situation in order for us to survive. And, you know, from my own perspective, you know, Masterpiece has always been a great fair because I've learned a lot while I go there. I'm not, I'm not so clued up on antiquities or jewels or manuscripts. So the experience of the curiosity when you go to a fair such as this is that you, you actually are on a new journey of learning and enjoying and taking very beautiful pieces that have been very well curated. And also from a perspective, from a commercial point of view, that galleries reach out to new collectors and educate them. And so they fall in love with a new body of work. So, you know, there is, there is so much here that is changing for us. But perhaps at the end of it, how I look at it, not just from a business point of view, that's actually a great time for us to re-edit what we're all doing in, and for wherever we're from, because I think it's affected everyone in different ways. I mean, I'm heavily involved in institutions and I know the issues coming ahead. From a commercial point of view, we know all the issues ahead of us and, you know, the fairs of all uh, at the moment all are on pause. You know, the way people are buying is all very different. And yet people need to experience things. I mean, we have to continue. So for me, it's like, you know, the next steps, one has to always look at them positively and, and get the best benefit out of that. And the wonderful thing like is, you know, Masterpiece may be on pause, but it's still happening and it's still communicating. And, you know, it's, it's still doing what it has to do in a very difficult year for everybody. I think people are actually selling things as well, aren't they, I hear? 
very very much so. I mean, That's I was actually point. quite I was actually quite surprised um, that. But you know, the one thing with homes, I think we've all focused on our homes. Our homes are becoming very crucial to us. Um, it's kind of the opposite of hospitality, sadly. So our lives are about our homes. We are more focused on our homes, depending on which level of what you can afford. Everybody is, is kind of thinking, what can I do to improve? So I think, you know, with people who are in the furniture businesses, whether antiques or contemporary, I think, you know, they've, they've seen some very good positive things happen through this time. Okay. Just wait, one very last question. Um, and we better be quick about this because we want to move on to, to um, questions from, from viewers. But I'm just wondering, is there a danger that if the digital platforms and the offerings that we're making are so good and so sophisticated and so compelling, is there a risk that actually it takes away the actual desire to go to a museum or to go to an art gallery? Um, just a few quick responses on this. You'd start with you, Helen. What do you think? Well, on the one level, it's an experience, uh, and you and you can't just get that viewing something online. But on mm. a, on a, another level, of course, there is nothing that really lives up to seeing the art in the flesh. I mean, it, 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 the, the the materiality of it. Um, the, the presence of it, it's, it's there. It's a great work of art. So I don't think it will ever replace it, no. And hearing those uh, clocks ticking as well, that's a key thing, isn't it? <laughs> Rebecca, what do you feel? Yeah, I absolutely. I, Helen couldn't have put it better. In fact, it's given me a, like a, almost a kind of aching desire to walk through the rooms at the Wallace again and hear the clocks ticking. So <laughs> I don't think it, uh, never mind our own collection. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's it's not just it, it's that experience in front of a work of art, but it is also often I think um, for some of our other ways that we do it a communal experience. The idea of listening to an artist talking about their work in a group of people gathered together, or a meaningful way that one might go with another individual to look at a work of art and talk about it. Um, I don't think we'll ever quite replace those experiences. Okay, what do you feel, Francis? Well, I'm also for the human experience. I mean, I'm not the most digital person there is. So for me, you know, I need, I need to see things. I need to feel things. I need to hear things. I need, I need to listen and look around something and control the experience myself rather than be limited by what happens virtually. Because at the end of the day, it can never take over what we feel and see ourselves. And enough, you will never get that goosebumps of a feeling when you walk into a room in an exhibition in a museum or a gallery. That will never, we'll never have that same feeling. So I suppose we'll all know it, no matter how fast digital improves, when we do get back to our controlled normality, we will be so relieved to be, you know, feeling, you know, real again in that sense. Okay, thank you. Okay, now uh, we've got some questions here. Um, actually, we're going to start with Francis, go back to you. Francis mentions how collectors are now buying differently due to the pandemic. Could he elucidate further? Um, well, you know, obviously with what we sell, it's, it's obviously appealing to a certain group of collectors, hence to the value. Um, you know, people don't stop buying, they don't stop making homes. I mean, obviously there are corrections in the markets coming ahead. And these kind of collectors are also very important to institutions because some of them are very major donors. So it, we're all connected, you know, because, you know, we, we all rely on their patronage and to support things for a wider public in a different way. And um, they, their, their patterns have changed somewhat thinking, um, you know, with let's say some of the more important businessmen, maybe they might get a better deal. And I think with a commercial That's gallery- That's a key thing. Are, are you discounting a bit at the moment? Because a lot of dealers are. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, we also, I mean, from our point of view, you know, it's about, you know, creating a relationship. Um, it's, you, do, you do have to look and review what you're selling pieces for, and you do need to keep businesses running. So you, you have to make concessions. It's very important at a time like this, and you have to be, have to be seen to. 
but also at the end of the day, you've also got artists and designers that their livelihoods rely on this, and you've got the people involved in the the, the businesses, the galleries, or the institutions that they're, they're, one needs the income. So it's a very it's a very balanced thing when one makes decisions. But I think the best thing is to have a very positive outlook and think you know you 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 have value to what you do. And you must always sell at the value, but you must always look at making sure that you turn over. So it's it's like all things, art and design is a business, like institutions are today. Okay. Uh, what will all this mean for museum educators? Who would like to pick this one up? Um, I can have a yeah, go sure. at that, if you like. I mean, obviously, we don't know quite what it means for... I feel like we're learning all the time about this. But one thing that I would say, and, and we have been very... Uh, we, we've had many of our staff furloughed. But I think that all education, all educators, whether they're, um, you know, working now or thinking about when they can get back, they are all deeply creative individuals um, in whatever ways that might be they always start with their audience in mind. And I think about uh, the, the little team that's been working with me about, you know, showing families how to make batik printed fabric from her own kitchen, one of them or, or, or another, um, you know, running a project for young people all the way through this lockdown to enable them to keep making. It's, it's so audience focused. Um, what educators do and there will be there will remain so many people in isolation who who cannot get to us and cannot ever get to us actually that I think um, they will remain an essential part of of our what what we are what we do what we are Helen have you got some thoughts on this um, well I think Rebecca summed it up very eloquently, but I think it's going to play uh, more of a role in our educational and learning program than perhaps it has done so far. Um, again, it's this hybrid learning, isn't it? It's this blended learning. Um, some things we, uh, I'm sure, will continue to offer online, um, but other things will be more about coming to Hartford House and, and being on site. So um, we'll, we'll very much be, be doing the both, the hybrid. Okay. Um, do you think that VR technology, as, to, uh, as opposed to high-resolution photography, could be more effective in encouraging visitors to spend more time engaging with individual works? Uh, who wants to pick this one up? I'm not, I'm not a great expert on VR, but I, I would say that our, our master's programme, which focuses on specialist areas of cultural leadership, has a whole module on technology and innovation where we have looked a bit at that idea of VR. Um, and there are wonderful things that can happen. I think, again, my, my only slight difficulty with so many of those things is that they are individual experiences. So you can walk through wonderful things and look at them and feel like you're really there, but you often can only do that alone. So uh, is, is kind of, I haven't yet seen a VR experience that can create a group experience in that same way. So, yes, and it could be um, a bit odd if a few people are wandering around with VR headsets and the rest of us is uh, looking with our eyes. It, it could be a curious one. Does uh, a, a VR uh, yeah. come into your purview, Helen? Yes, um, in fact, uh, what these exploding models I was talking about earlier, the digital furniture models, um, they, you, you can use VR with them. And it's a bit like being a woodworm inside the chest of drawers. You, know, you can really get into it and actually be inside it. And that's quite exciting. But it is, as you say, Rebecca, it's a, a, an individual experience. Okay, one of the great assets of the great museums is the expertise of their curators. How can you share that digitally? I would add to that also in an interesting way, rather than just great block of text. Rebecca, do you want to kick off there? Sure. Um, well, of course. I mean, uh, all of our curatorial teams are absolutely, the, you know, that their expertise um, 
creates and, and generates those displays and collections displays and temporary exhibitions. Um, but I do feel that the curator, the role of the curator has already changed since the, you know, way before this coronavirus episode from a, a perception years ago of being some sort of ivory tar character who just researched the objects. Um, all curators now engage with their publics, deliver talks, will do Q and A's, will come and answer questions. So I, I feel like our curators are already very involved in that. Okay. Uh, what, what do you think, Helen? Well, one thing I've always felt about the uh, Wallace Collection, not always felt, but felt very recently, is that it's a great museum filled with artworks that, that embody peasants don't matter. And uh, <laughs> you can see why the French Revolution happened in, in, a, way, yeah. in a way there. And I'm just wondering how, um, given what's happening now, curators might bring alive your collection, amazing collection in different ways. Well, I think um, part of the problem may be because you see it as this French 18th century um, collection. We have so much more than that. Uh, and, you know, the, the French 18th century part is, is a very strong part and it's a world renowned collection. Um, but our Renaissance collection, our old master paintings, our Ottoman, Middle East and Asian arms and armor, there's so much to discover. And I think it it hasn't been getting out there enough. And I think this, this, this experience that we've had over the last four months has um, enhanced our realization that we do need to be, we need to be filming our gallery talks. We need to be getting curators um, online doing, I mean, Zoom lectures can, can get, our, our, our arms and armor curator had 880 people to a Zoom lecture the other day. I mean, a maximum. Was that, was that, was that the jousting one? Or, exactly, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, that was fantastic. Yeah, so uh, we, you know, we can get a maximum of 150 people into our lecture theatre, and they all have to be in central London by definition, whereas this way we can be doing much, much more exciting things uh, on, on a much more international basis too. Yeah. But you might actually mention that your curator of arms and armour actually jousts, doesn't he? <laughs> he does indeed, yes. <laughs> Famously so. <laughs> okay, then we have, um, and we can weave in Francis on this, when restrictions are fully lifted, what is the likelihood that museums and institutions, I'll add galleries, will continue to invest in developing their digital platforms? Because what was alluded to is it's not free doing this, is it? It costs money. So when there is a return to some kind of normality. Will the same level of investment in, in digital platforms be continuing? Uh, what about Francis? Will, you, will your gallery continue investing in the digital side of things? Yeah, I think it's, it's made us all realize as well that it's a huge important part of now doing business, which many people will be getting settled into as reviewing it as a weekly or a monthly review of what they're looking at. So I think but you know, personally, I think as well, we will revert to written publications. And it's important that, you know, we, we publish a few hardback copies of exhibitions or artists' works. And I don't, personally, I don't think anything can take that away from me, the pleasure of actually having a physical book rather than looking at everything digitally. But I think it's going to be a situation where budgets are now are divided in a way to give equal importance to both. And it's going to be a learning curve for everybody to decide what, when things do come to different normalities, what is working best for each individual institution or gallery. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca? Will there be continued to be this high level of uh, investment in digital ARA? Yeah, I mean, I think yes, because I think it is something that we want to keep doing, to keep engaging all our different audiences. And Helen? Sorry. Um, I think it would be a very brave um, and rather foolish organisation that said no. I think this is absolutely vital. It's here to stay. Um, it's now an in ingrained part of our um, makeup as, as museums and galleries. Okay. Well, this next question is an extension of that. Rebecca, I was interested in what you said about social media going both in both directions, as it is definitely often the case that cultural institutions provide information rather than have conversations with their followers. A key factor of this, in this is staffing. 
how many people do you have managing your Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> or is that confidential? I don't know. Um, I'm sorry, because I slightly lost the connection before there, but um, I've read that question, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have, we, we do have, I mean, he, he's, we do have one main um, social media manager who's been featured actually, I think in the New York Times, Scott, for what right. he's done to sort of turn around our, uh, or not turn around, but to enhance our Twitter and social media presence. To be honest, I've often wondered myself how he takes time off. So um, I probably need to find out if he's been training up acolytes, but I, I suspect he's just a very busy bee at the minute. I don't um, think he's taking any time off, is he? No, it doesn't. <laughs> um, <Our business. laughs> on museum websites, you're sometimes redirected to other platforms better suited to support the format of engagement, for example, YouTube. Has there been any research on whether this enhances the experiences as better tech or limits it as it takes the user away from the museum parent site? Um, Helen, can you have a go at that? Or... Uh, I'm afraid that's probably slightly beyond my technical expertise, <laughs> that, actually. Um... We might have to go back to Rebecca on that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, quite, that's quite a techie one. She can't turn on her volume. Oh, I see. <laughs> She's got a look of horror on her face, but um, I don't know. I'm afraid. I think maybe it's just about. Okay. About um, moving to YouTube, maybe for longer videos. That's a bit of a geeky one, so we'll we'll move on. Uh, can't wait to be back in the Wallace collection again. As I think we're all saying that sharing the experience of being in front of artworks can be life changing. I want to ask how funding for many of the school and community hard to reach groups will be supported when money is so tight. Um, what do you feel, Helen? Well, yes, I mean, that, that's obviously going to be a, a, a big worry for us. Um, we have, uh, as I slightly alluded to earlier on, we have a very generous um, group of benefactors and uh, our friends, but we will also have to look to um, trust funding. Um, we'll also probably have to, um, uh, you know, look for um, more um, yes, trusts and, and organizations that will fund education specifically. Um, this is a whole area in itself, really. I mean, many funding bodies are actually specifically looking to fund education. So we will have to be um, really plugged into those. Um, Rebecca, this yeah, is really, so, yeah, sorry, this is a really important point, Rebecca, isn't it? It's bring along the next generation of people who value and enjoy looking at art. Absolutely. And that um, possibility, we are, we are funded only by um, our friends, our revenues and our philanthropists. So um, we will hope to find ways to continue to delight them and to continue to reinforce to them the absolute essential nature of what they give to us to enable us to reach some of those harder to reach groups. Okay. And a final question, I think, because I think we're uh, getting near to the end. Um, and I think all the panelists can have a go at this one. Do you think that the forced focus on the use of technology presents a huge opportunity, that's in big block capitals for galleries? To take one example, I've long felt that while the presentation of exhibitions has improved in leaps and bounds in recent years, things such as labeling and audio guides, both in terms of content and delivery, have a long way to go. Views, please. Um, do you want to start, Francis, in terms of the huge opportunity that digital presents to galleries in your context? Commercial? Yeah, I, I think sometimes, you know, as a person going into a gallery, sometimes there's a much more of a lack of information because it's from a commercial sense or from a curatorial point of view about the visual experience and about selling rather than also the educating part of the exhibition. Looking at commercial entities, now they're putting as, as much emphasis on the dialogue of educating because they have to reach out in a different way to their audiences and make new audiences. So I think the benefits of this 
are actually very big because actually when I go personally now and go to a gallery looking at a different exhibition, I get a totally different ex experience. It's not just about looking, but I'm also learning about the background of the work and why the works are formed and have the time to understand it. So yes, I think it's very good what's going on. Okay. Rebecca, in terms of this huge opportunity through a terrible um, circumstance? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we do have some good, um, we do have some good audio tours. Um, they're quite difficult to repurpose in the COVID era, but they've been working very hard with us to try and think about how to do that. But mainly I would just say that I think we all learn in different ways and we all want to experience exhibitions and collections in different ways. And if digital can add new and extended ways for people to be able to engage, then we must keep exploring that okay. for all neurodiverse and, and learning styles. And for you, Helen, the Wallace Collection is an amazing sort of time capsule in, in, on one level. I, I presume that the, this, the, 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 the pandemic and the crisis and that the shift to digital actually has been quite a dynamic and refreshing thing for the museum. Is that, is that the case? I, I think it's um, been a very, very useful four months from that point of view, this big opportunity or amazing opportunity that the questioner asked about. I mean, we have, we have the issue that we want people to experience the art in the galleries, um, leaving aside exhibitions, but in our permanent collection. And we don't want to have lots of labels all over the place. So um, we've been struggling with this idea of, of, of how best we can interpret the art for people for some time. And I agree with Rebecca, there are several different ways that people like to engage with art. But if we can add this digital um, uh, method, uh, particularly as now we've all got used to it over four months. I mean, I'm sure all of us now are looking at many, many more things um, online than we ever did before. So okay. it will continue. I think I need to wrap it up. I think what the takeaway for me is actually these digital platforms and so on, uh, all they're doing really is uh, encouraging more people to actually look at art, uh, which is to be celebrated, and people are raring to go and look back and look at the real things. So that's fantastic. So who needs to add some puppies? <laughs> Thank you so much, for panelists. It's been a really interesting conversation. I hope the viewers have enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.